So, um, welcome to my talk about um, bad things about Postgres. <laughs> so, why are you here? That's the interesting question. And why did this talk ever get accepted? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, so, uh, before I show you what um, there are some missing features or less complete features as compared to other databases, that's the important part of this, this talk today. I'm only presenting features that do exist in other databases or that work in a more standard conformant way. Otherwise, it would be pointless because there are so many features that are supported by no, not a single database. I mean, I, I could list them, but that's pretty much pointless. So the, the exercise in this um, gap analysis was to find the gaps, actually. So where does this data come from? The background is that I run a website called modernsql.com. Who has ever um, seen that page? Oh, great. So. Um, what I'm doing there, the aim of this web page is to um, teach the new SQL features to developers. That's the primary aim, where new means pretty much everything that was released after SQL 92, and surprise enough, also a few stuff that, that was done in, in SQL 92 already. But there's also the second point I have to take care. I also want to make it visible to developers which database supports these features. And this is pretty much where this data comes from. So if you look at modernsql.com, you will see matrices like this. And here I've took one where Postgres is better than all the other ones. So that's the, the only um, time you see it like this here. <laughs> Sorry. <yeah. laughs> um, so uh, how do I come to this red axis and these this green check marks? They are based on actual test cases. I used to start um, making them by reading the docs, but that was pretty much uh, at that end. So I now have test cases, and whenever there is a red X, it basically means a test case was failed, one or more test cases were failed, and when there is a check mark, it means all tests were passed. Um, I, I come up with these test cases by actually reading the standard, the real standard, the document. Yes, that's, that's as, as bad as it, as it sounds. So um, that also means uh, there, there is a, uh, the standard defines so many aspects of, of stuff. And I'm not testing all of this every time. So the depth at which I'm testing, it, it greatly varies. You will see um, some examples where I look at really small, small, small details, like the first example I have for you today for the gap. Um, and in other cases, I'm just doing some kind of screening to, to see, OK, which database can do that. That's just what I have at the moment. I aim to go into the details for all the features. But yeah, well, if you know the standard, it's, yeah. It will take me one or two lives, I don't know. Um, one last word for brevity. I'm using the word wrong to mean not, not as according to the standard, and more importantly, not as, as, as according to the standard like I understand it, which might be wrong true uh, as well. So um, that's really just, it doesn't mean it's bad, it doesn't mean it needs fixing. Some do need fixing, some might be bad, but just because I'm saying wrong, doesn't mean um, to imply anything, uh, any judgment. It's just from the standards perspective, not conforming to the standard. OK, let's get started. I start first by features that are available in Postgres, but have some gaps regarding to other databases when you look at the details. And the first one um, is extract. You won't believe that there is a small gap in how Postgres implements extract. And it's a really, really, really small one. So this is how I can demonstrate at, at what kind of detail I'm looking, if I can. So you see, it's actually checkmarked everywhere. Um, but there are some, uh, uh, some footnotes. And the footnote says, it returns an approximate numeric type. Hmm. And that's even documented. So it's double precision. Okay. But if you look into the standard, then it clearly says, clearly says that in, in both cases, um, it has to return an implementation-defined exact numeric type. So this is the gap. And this is really one of the smallish things. And if you look back at the matrix, I did not even, uh, I, I still uh, checkmarked it fully green because this is so small, it's not worth actually mentioning. It. Yet I, I'm showing it here to, to show you uh, at what detail I aim to look at. So next one. This is one I think it's well known in the community. It's also documented. Respect nulls and ignore nulls in some window functions, first value, last value, and so on. And if you look, there are some databases that support that. 
So there, there is technically a gap. That's all what I, what I mean to say here. Um, there's a patch for that. I don't think. Is there? Since when? Okay, so there's a patch which is. It, it's gotten a little okay. bit right, but he and I were chatting about it today, and then we're hoping okay. to bring it back. Okay. Like somebody else or we should patch, but then abandon. They use Gothic, but you can have abandoned it as well. Right, I talked to him about it today. Okay. It's kind of, I think it becomes also a bit difficult clause. Um, yeah, that's no. a good point. No, I don't, I don't uh, it, it doesn't, because the filter clause only applies to aggregate functions. Yeah. And those don't qualify as aggregate functions. Yet, I think it might be an interesting idea to, to add the, the filter clause for the non-aggregates as well. That, that would kind of, okay. <laughs> just an idea. Okay. So um, one more uh, statement. These, most of these matrices are based on some 11 snapshot. It's not the beta 1, something like a week before the beta 1. So it's no, most definitely we know the window functions get a, a big extension with Postgres 11. So this was already considered there. Therefore, I don't um, bring up the range as a, uh, as a gap, because it's, that let's consider that um, fixed as long as it doesn't get rollbacked. Um, OK, so there is a patch, but it's not applied for 11. And yeah, OK. So there is a gap. Hopefully, we'll fix it in 12. But yeah, okay. I agree with that particular one. Yeah. yeah, also the documentation agrees. It, it's well known. Everybody knows that. I mean, it, it, it's no surprise. Um, yet it's a gap which um, comes out of this analysis. Another gap which you may or may not be aware of is um, distinct aggregate functions when you use them as uh, window functions, like distinct count or distinct sum or whatever. Um, there's only one database supporting that. That's the way it is. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So the, yeah, there's nothing more I can say. It's a gap. That's what it is. There's another gap when it comes to fetch first, fetch next, and so on. You know, this is basically what the limit clause does, but a little bit uh, more advanced, let's put it that way, or at least more keywords for the same purpose. Um, so what's the gap in there? Um, you see it here, actually. So there are two times um, these red X's here. And they are about the options percent and with ties. Because the fetch first clause actually also um, allows to say, I would not like to fetch like 10 rows. You can ask for 10% of the result set. And you can also ask for like 10 rows, but please include ties in case the order by clause does not establish an absolute um, sort order. And in the form like it is defined in the standard, only the Oracle database has supported at the moment. But if you look at SQL Server, there's also um, one note. Um, because SQL Server does not have the fetch first clause, but it has the top syntax for that. So it reads select top, and then you give the number there. And for this top <coughs> syntax, it actually supports both of these variants. So you can ask for top 10% in SQL Server, and you can also ask for um, top uh, five rows with ties. So that's why I, I want to highlight that the functionality is there, although it got a red X because the syntax is not the same. Yeah, and that's documented in the list of missing features of Postgres, it's documented. There are two um, feature IDs assigned in the, in the SQL standard, and it's documented that they are not there. OK. Functional dependencies. That's a fun one. It's actually a sad one. If you just look at the matrix, it might be the biggest surprise you have ever seen. <laughs> yeah, that's MySQL. It's not a mistake. That, that's really MySQL uh, has a pretty good support, the best support I've ever seen for detecting um, functional dependencies. Postgres um, ranks in second, as you can see. Um, so what is it about? Is it really important? I don't know. It's, it's, it's documented as well. It says partially supported. I agree with that, as you can see in the slides and in the check marks. I have just one example for you where I have assigned the light green check mark to Postgres. Because what, what is it about functional dependencies? It's basically knowing that one a set of columns depends on the values of a set of another columns. And if you look at this query, um, if you just look at the table T1 for the, oh, back. Uh, um, if you look at the T1, I'm doing a group by the primary key of T1, but I'm also joining T2 
also via the primary key to another primary key. And finally, I'm selecting something from T2, some other column. And if you have proper functional um, dependency checking, this is valid. Because it turns out that if you, the T1PK implies the result that the T1B has only one distinct value, so it, it's valid. If you have this optional feature implemented in, in your database. And this is the, basically the one test case which failed here, so it didn't give it a solid green check mark, but the light green check mark. And this is how functional dependencies look in the standard. That's just a table of contents. So it's spread about, about, across 10 pages, which are really hard to digest. And the best thing, it's not even complete. It still leaves room for uh, vendor extensions. Like what I can think of is if you're doing some row number together with the partition by clause, if the partition happens to be a primary key, then, then you can also have uh, new functional dependencies. The same is true for uh, for ordinality, if you do unnest or, or anything like that. So there's still room for um, window extensions there. Okay. This was the first part. And the first part is features that are there, but in some way less com conforming and less complete than, than in other databases. And it was really hard to find those things. Because uh, generally said, Postgres is leading in, in standard conformance. Now let's look at the second part. Features that I'm missing uh, at all. And my most favorite feature is row pattern recognition. Who has ever seen that? Ah, one at least. Did it change your life already? I think it's pretty interesting. Oh, pretty interesting. <laughs> if you think um, window functions are awesome, then yeah, you will like that. Um, this is. I think, personally, this is the most important feature for the next decade, maybe. It's really, it's really as, at least as exp, uh, important as window functions. I will show you what it does. And the example I have chosen here is um, like processing a, a log file, a stream of events. Let's say this is um, some web log file where you have hits to some, some web pages. And what you would like to do is to, to do some statistics on them. Like count how many sessions do I have in this log file? Or what's the average duration of one of these sessions? These are the two examples which I will now um, solve using this new feature. And you can see there there's this 30 minute threshold. So I define one session is as long as the next hit is within 13 minutes of the previous hit. And this is how the query looks like um, with this new feature. And in good old tradition of SQL, it makes most sense to read it up. Da, uh, from bottom up, and not the other way around. So what is it? The general idea of this is that you would like to, to combine rows in some logical way, very much like group by does, but in a more flexible way. And a more flexible way means by using regular expressions to match them, to match rows together, to mark them as they belong together. And once you have matched them in one whatever group you want to say, you can post-process them. You can then apply a group by, you can do similar things like window functions and so on. But the really important thing is, the idea is apply regular expressions over a sequence of rows to identify matches, and so you can then process um, some statistics and whatever over these matches. And if you think of regular expressions, um, they were characters. They work based on characters. What they are matching are characters. But what we are matching here, these are rows. And in a normal regular expression, a character usually stands for itself, except of those few meta characters like star and dot and so on. But we don't have this here in, 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 in uh, SQL. We need to define some names, how we can, can define a, a, a row. And this is what we have the define class for. So what we can assign there, we can have some names, like what I have here is um, continuation, cont. And I assign some, uh, some condition, like when the timestamp is less than the previous timestamp, and you see this previous is pretty much like lag in, in for window functions, um, plus interval 30 minutes. So when it falls into this inner interval, then this row can be assigned the property of being this cont tag. And this is something you can then use in the next step, which is actually the regular expression inside this pattern. What you see there is regular expression syntax. The main difference is just not characters, 
but these variables which we have just defined. And there's one odd thing, I must admit. Um, if you say any, or basically if you use some name in here, you see the cont is the one I have, have defined down there, but the any is not defined. And the strange rule is that if it's not defined, then it matches everything. So this means the any will pretty much match just any row, but only once, because it's a regular expression, there's no quantifier there. And then it will start to try matching these cont rows. And it will succeed as long as they fall within this 30-minute uh, period, as long as this um, condition here um, applies true. And because there's a star, like in regular expressions, it will it make it 0, 1, or however often. And this is the star you know from regular expressions. It could be a plus as well. The dialect which is used there is um, defined in the standard itself. So it's not reusing some POSIX uh, or whatever dialect. Um, and it's not actually as powerful, but it's still, um, most of it is, is still, the useful stuff is there, I would say. Yes, question. Do you know if it's a, a direct subset, or is it conflicting against regular expressions? I think it is a, a subset. I mean, it, it, it does have some extensions. Okay. So it, it does have some strange features with, uh, which are not in any other regular expression syntax. Exactly, exactly, exactly. That, that's, that's the important stuff. It's not on characters. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, you can also, the white spaces are irrelevant there. Yeah. So it's not, I mean, it's not meaningful to ask if it's a subset of regular expressions in the it's a completely different piece. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, I think the question I was trying to drive at is, if it was to be extended by the committee in the future, would it be extended in some manner that would be more consistent with what we think of as regular I, may, I can give you one example which is missing in this subset. It's, it's character classes. So okay. you, you cannot do character classes, but you can do an or. You can use the pipe. Okay. You can also use brackets. You have the greedy and non-greedy matching. Um, it's, yeah. Okay. Of course, it doesn't make sense to have some, some shortcuts for character classes too, like, like upper or lower or something right. like that. That just doesn't make sense. Right. Um, but as far as I've seen, there are some extensions, but I'm, I, yeah. As long as these are not characters which you are matching, it doesn't matter. It's, it's more like, it's more like, like <coughs> parser level rather than lexer level, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm just wondering about, I mean, the things that you talked about in other database systems, you know, what do those look like and, and what would the committee likely be looking at? I have it in one slide, it's a one, okay. one strange feature. Sure. <coughs> so that is the, the regular expression. And here comes one. Um, Another interesting thing. Here you can say, in the result, I would like to have one row per match, which implies you could also so, say all rows per match. And this is the difference between making a group by, actually, or working more like in a window function fashion. And there's the measures clause, which pretty much, much translates to the select clause. So you can define some columns in there. And the way I'm doing it here, I'm using the last and first uh, functions. And I have no idea why they are called last and first and not last value and first value like the window functions. It's the way it is. Um, and they can access um, pretty much any rows in, in this matched set of rows. Another interesting thing, which is um, not actually shown in this, this example, <coughs> sorry, um, these variable names which we have defined in the define clause, we can access them later on. Once if it has uh, matched, you can say, for example, the last out of the cont matched rows. In this particular example, I could also have used any.ts because any is the first match. It only matches one row. So it's pretty much the same like, like first ts. Yeah, and that's pretty much the query. There's an order by clause. You can have partition by clause. Hmm. No big deal. Other than that, at the end, I'm just doing the, the um, statistics I've mentioned there. So uh, here I'm doing average and count of the sessions to finally get the result um, like I described it before. So what I like about this feature is, is the endless possibilities you have in one feature, which, which can do quite a lot. So I've shown you you can do group by because you can save one row per match. 
you can um, work like, o uh, like with the over clause because you can say all rows per match. You can uh, have, unlike window functions, you, don't can, you cannot define a, a sliding window, but you have at least two semantics you can choose from. The final semantic, which is pretty much like from unbounded preceding to unbounded following, and the, the running semantic, which is from rows unbounded preceding to current row. So the, the two use cases you use most often uh, are there. Um, you have features like um, you otherwise find in having or where uh, clauses, because this you, you can encode this in the um, definitions and in the pattern clause. Um, you can even combine group by and, and over. So um, I have an example in other slides I will show you um, where some rows are passed through one by one, and another set of rows is condensed into a single one. So you com can combine this in one go. Um, Data-driven matching, like the bin fitting problem can be solved with that because these definitions you can also use like a sum. So match as long as the sum is below some threshold, which can be some dynamic pr threshold. So that, that's really wow powerful. And uh, another thing is you cannot only filter out rows, you can even duplicate rows to some extent. So one example I have in my slides is if you have some um, scheduling system where you have um, room bookings from two, from two, from two, you can have one match recognized clause that um, fills you the gaps. It makes you new rows for the missing gaps. So you get more rows out of this clause than you have sent in. That's also possible to some, some extent. So I really think it's, it's super awesome and a little bit complex. Um, but once you get used into the thinking, it's really wow. Um, all this nesting of window functions. If you have a query that nests window functions, I bet this can solve it with a single expression. So can you use it yet? Yes. Yes, <laughs> there's one database that supports it. Um, if you're interested in this feature, I have uh, some resources for you here. There's a free technical report by ISO. Go read it if you're interested in this feature. It gives you good use cases, it's free, um, and it's not like standard talk, it's like normal talk. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, did Oracle... Um, like they implemented it first and then it came into the standard. It, and it, was it, did it exist before they got standardized? Or yes, it was in Oracle um, 12, uh -huh. and it came into the standard with 2016. So um, it was in Oracle working, and I think there might be even some gaps. It's kind of a cheating way to get the text in, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, but there, there is still there's, there, there is still room to outperform them because they are only supporting one out of the three features that are defined in the standard, as you can see there. Because um, what I've shown you is the match recognized clause, like you use it as a table function, similar to the table function, but um, the standard also defines it that you can use it um, as a framing clause of window functions. So that instead of saying unbounded preceding and whatever, that you can put a pattern in there to say over which, how the, how the window moves, how the frame of the window basically looks like. And this is not implemented by, by yeah. <laughs> That's not implemented by, by Postgres, so go ahead. There is, I mean, you don't, you, you don't show it, like, no database that wants that standard at all? Pardon? Uh, you have a list of databases there that don't support it. Yes. I think there are some, some less SQL databases that support this concept. Okay, all right, so well, there are some out there that have some. Okay. Yeah, but don't ask me for names. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen it, um, but not in, in the big ones. Okay. Um, so read this paper if you're interested in this feature. And then go to the standard and make sense out of the standard, but don't go to the standard first. It seems, it seems a like a little bit related to the stream SQL stuff. Which is, uh -huh. I think, in the, there's like a working group that's like going to pop out of standard sometime quite soon, apparently. It's, okay. That, that seems kind of... Yeah, I don't know that. So I'm not, not affiliated with the standard committee at all. I'm just buying the standard and, and trying to make sense out of it. I always say others study the Bible. <laughs> I study, study the standard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which is more pointless, but... <laughs> You can fill a life with both of them. Okay, so read this one. Another recommendation I have is, of course, my own set of slides. I've mentioned some use cases before. You can find them in these slides. And because Oracle is the only database that supports that yet, 
there is one guy, um, one Oracle uh, consultant who has quite a lot of stuff on material on that. That's Hugh Ashton. Um, go to his um, blog and look for match recognize, which is the keyword. And there you can find some other interesting use cases and so on. Uh, maybe one last word. All the benchmarks I've done when I was comparing um, the window function solution to the match recognize solution, in pretty much all cases, the match recognize was faster. And that even applies to such simple um, cases like top n per group. So you have a category, and you're usually uh, doing, you know, row number partition by, and then an outside query um, where the row number is less than something. Even that was faster with match recognize because it's basically just carré, then match anything, um, curly brackets 10 or whatever, and that's it. And the partition by clause maybe. And it was faster than the window function implementation. So I think there's a, a lot of potential in there. Then the next one. Temporal and bitemporal tables. Ah, yeah, there are some discussions recently. Um, I'll first go to what, what is it about, and I give you another hint where you can find good information. Of course, you can read the standard, but you can also read this um, paper, which was released um, a few months after it was um, put into the standard. And it's also a good paper. It's a paper you can download. It's for free, and it gives you quite um, comprehensive answers on the ideas. It also gives you an example. You will see syntax there. Go read this paper. If you don't have access to the standard, this is the next best resource to look at. Don't look at the documentation at other databases. Take this, or the standard, of course. But also read this first, because you start um, trying to make sense out of the standard. So what is it about? There are two distinct concepts, system versioning and application versioning. And the idea is that um, these model two different time dimensions. The system versioning um, is there to model when, when we learned about some change in the reality, while the application versioning is meant to model when some change happened in the reality. The typical example is when, when some um, couple marries, and maybe a, a name changes. It happens at the date of marriage. But when you learn about it, this is pretty much later usually as a company, as a bank or whatever. And um, these are the two concepts to model these two things. And the system versioning is named system versioning because the system manages it, because it's easy enough to just look at the system watch and use this timestamp to recognize when we learned about something. And the application versioning is consequently called application versioning because the application has to provide the proper timestamps, which might be in the past or even in the future. Like if you have a fee schedule, you would like to have maybe some discount as of tomorrow starting, then you can put it um, with timestamps in the future. Um, both of them in the standard can, used, uh, can be used on a table level, and they can in be intermixed as you like. So you can have none of them, or you can have both of them, or only one of them as you like it. Um, in the DDL, both of them require, according to the standard, explicit columns which um, give you the start and the end timestamp of when this, this row va was valid. So both of them require that explicitly. And on top of that, they require something which is called a period, which logically combines that in what we know as a range type on some timestamp thingy. Um, in system versioning, you have to use the generate always clause so to tell the system, take care of that. The system sets these timestamps for you. I mean, the, the period name is, is fixed. It's system underscore time. On the application versioning side, you can use um, arbitrary columns, of course, and you can also use arbitrary period names, but you have to use that. Um, the DMLs, like um, insert, update, delete, merge, system versioning takes care of that. It's mostly transparent to the application. I say mostly because the two columns you have to add to the table, they are visible. And some databases, to make it 100% transparent, offer some invisible or hidden columns, but that's not a feature from the standard. On the other hand, the application versioning um, is completely up to the user. So if you want to have um, only the current row, you have to write a WHERE clause for it. The, uh, the standard does give you, however, some, some tools to, to make that work. And you have to take about, uh, care about constraints as well in application versioning. But it gives you a tool. Like now, a primary key can read like um, primary key ID, comma, 
without overlaps and then the name of the period, which is very much like an exclusion constraint in Postgres, like we have it today. So the standard um, provides a framework. And here, for example, we have it on the right-hand side for the application versioning. We have new predicates, like contains, which work on, on these periods of this, what we call range types. On the other hand, in the system versioning, we have an extension of the from clause. In the from clause, in the system versioning, per default, we only see the current data. We don't see historic data until we ask for it. And the way you ask for it in, in system versioning, according to the standard, is um, you say from table name, and then for system time, and then you can say like as of three hours ago, like current timestamp minus interval three hours. Or you can say between to get everything, and there's also a from and to syntax. So this is the way you work to work with system versioning. But according to the standard, these are two distinct things. With system versioning, we're using this for system time as of stuff, while for application versioning, we're using the, the where clause. Um, recent, more or less recent discussion I found on the hackers list was um, the as of queries. This was around um, uh, Christmas time. And for the application versioning, there was a patch sent like a week ago. I think there hasn't been much discussion about that yet. But I think this is, this is the current um, state of art I know about Postgres. OK, so this is pretty much the distinction um, system versioning, application versioning. Let's look in these two separately. So which databases are supporting system versioning as of right now? And yeah, you can see quite some check marks there. And the most interesting one is actually this one, MariaDB. It was released last week. So MariaDB is the MySQL clone, which is not Oracle owned, but run by the kind of old um, MySQL um, people. And yes, they have released it. I did test it. I found only one issue. That's this, this last X in, the, in there. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty close to, to what the commercial databases do as well. There are even some aspects which I like more than, than in the other, other databases. And I have to tell you something about Oracle. I mark them straight red here. If there's an Oracle representative, they will say, oh, but, 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 but we have S of. Yes. But it's something different. It's not in the, in the idea of how the standard sees system versioning. What they offer is you can access the, the undo log to get data from like a few minutes ago in case it's still there. Okay? The syntax is um, similar, but yet a little bit different. And the, the idea of having some audit trail or something is just not there. It's similar syntax, similar idea, but still something different. And if you are considering working on these, who is considering working on these? Hey, come on. Ah, one brave one. Ah, another one. Um, there's a few hints. Um, the system versioning in the standard, uh, it might have one or two gaps. First of all, schema changes are just not supported by the standard. When you have a system version table, pretty much every alter table will fail, except alter table drop system versioning. So the, the way to um, evolve such tables is to, um, according to the standard, is to alter table drop system versioning, which also drops all the historic rows. So they are gone. You can back up them first if you like. Um, then do the DDL you want to, to make, and then um, again alter enable system versioning. Yeah, it's not nice, it's a gap. Um, no retention. The standard doesn't give any framework like you could um, define like um, five years, I would like to keep that or whatever. Um, it's, it's even the opposite. It straightly says it's one of the aims that it cannot be fiddled with that. There is, I'm from Europe. And I'm presenting these features to, to developers. And the most common question, the first question I've got in the, like the last six months was, is this GDPR compliant? <laughs> and the answer is no. Because according to the standard, in the standard, you cannot have a four system time S of for delete. You cannot fiddle around with historic data. That's the point. It has audit character. Okay? So this is just not in the standard. Pretty much every implementation I have seen does offer a solution for that. But it's not standardized. The first time I got asked, is it GDPR compliant? I was like, hey, is this kidding this guy? But no, it is 
it's just read. Yeah. Question? So the implementations that you've seen, yeah. the database systems that provide this, are they all consistent or are they all? <coughs> no, they provide it. Like, um, uh, MariaDB has uh, an extension for the four clause in delete, so you can specifically delete something. In SQL Server, it works pretty much like described by the standard, except, so you disable it, it does not drop the historic records. You can then delete one specifically and re-enable it, and all of this in one transaction. It's, it's okay. Um, in DB2, it's also you can disable it, and you have a separate history table, which is not dropped if you disable it. And then you can fiddle around with that and then re-enable it. But I don't think it works in one transaction in DB2. So there's no, I mean, if the standard committee was to change it, they don't. There is no, it's no different cons everywhere. There's no consistency across yeah. those. So. That's okay. true. Right. So if you ask me which one to follow, I, I would personally take the, the MariaDB because it's the most convenient. And what MariaDB also got right is they have an extra, extra access right for that. So you need some extra grant so yeah, you can. Okay, um, and here is, I think, the worst issue. For system time, if you, if you work with system versioning, you have this, you can ask for system time as of, but this works only on base tables, not on views, and there's not even a session setting in the standard defined. The session setting is available in some of the databases, but it's not like you can now say alter session universe as of that timestamp, and every system version table would um, be used like that. That's just not there. You can make an extension, but the standard doesn't tell you how to do that. So you need, you need unique to look as of explicitly on every layer? On every from. Every it belongs to the from, and it, it doesn't apply to views. So if you have a view which queries some system version table, you cannot use the view for as of queries, mm -hmm. according to the standard. Yeah. Uh, does, does Maria DB extend that at all? Um, I think they have a session setting where you can say for all system version tables as of something. Because the view thing seems like something you'd want to be able to push down into the view as what you call it, doesn't it? Am I understanding correctly? Yeah. Just like the where clause. In and some sense, single, yeah. A single variable like that, I mean, if you want to do it, if it's a view and you have all the tables involved, you might want to do as of this time and as of this time different. It's possible according to the standard because you have to say it for each from class. Right. You can have it different. With the I think this is something you definitely need. Yeah. I, I think it's an omission, an unreasonable omission in the standard. Yeah, like so, therefore, I'm listing it. And the last thing, which is somehow questionable in the standard, <coughs> is transaction time. So this generate always as um, clauses, they um, assign the transaction time. So you have the same value within all the changes you do in one transaction. But the transaction time isn't the commit time. That means if you have a long running transaction, you're asking for as of some specific date in the past. It doesn't mean you get the same result as of that time. Yeah. Because it might have not, not have been committed. And uh, the transaction time is usually um, the first um, data change you run in a transaction. So there are also extensions by some vendors where you can transaction granulation or where you can map it, the transaction ID to the, to the commit time. But um, it's something to keep in mind. I think the standard is uh, uh, written flexible enough so that you could use the commit time for that. But it's just a little bit um, yeah, indirection. You need the indirection because if you do the changes first, you don't have the commit time at that time. So just so I understand, um, when is that time captured? Like if I the time is captured. So the standard says it is assigned at the time the first data change runs in a, in a transaction, and it is immutable from then on. Okay, so then it I does not say that it needs to assign that time. <laughs> a time. I think you could, you could. It has to be immutable. If you assign a time of X, and then. No, you, you can. What it is? So I begin a transaction. Yes. I do the first thing that touches something that's in a system version table. Yeah. You, you, you could system. query the system version table, the, the, the columns there. Okay, so as soon as I do something, I, I, can, I, I can actually see that. I can see what's been assigned. But it might be another week until I commit. Yeah. So technically, if you do the insert, you can write after the insert run a, a select on that. And then you, it will be the most current uh, version you see. Mm -hmm. So you can, these are explicit columns from two. You, you can look at them. Is there any guidance in terms of like, uh, 
current timestamp in PostgreSQL will be the same timestamp throughout the transaction. And now that, that's actually sort of when the transaction is open, correct? Yes, so or, or when the first de uh, data change is done. It, yeah. it, though in Postgres it is when yeah. the transaction is open. Okay. So in, uh, is there intended to be consistency between this concept of transaction type and, say, current time step? Um, in the standard wording, it's not consistent. This uh, transaction time is indeed some, some term which is used in the standard for the purpose of system versioning. Right, okay. so it's, it's a new term. It's in Thank you. Um, I'm running out of time, but let's go on. Um, notes from current implementations I've seen. The most common way to implement system versioning is having separate history tables. DB2 and SQL Server do it that way. Um, what I find quite interesting idea is how MariaDB does it. It has a single table which may be partitioned by a new magic way to partition current rows from past rows. So you may have it in a single table if you choose to, but you can also partition it. And you can also partition it like very old rows um, to cope with the question of data retention. You just drop the very old partitions. So it's not like two partitions. You have one current partition, and then you can have as many um, history partitions as you like. And finally mentioning that Oracle is accessing the undo log for that, which is pretty much a different idea. Application version tables. That's a little bit simpler. Who supports it? Yeah, DB2. Um, but if you look at the, at the notes, you will see that um, I've put there some notes like Postgres use range types for that. And this is also what, what the patch, which is currently um, was submitted uh, a few days ago, is basically about. It's a different syntax for range types. I think most of the functionality is already there in the Postgres core. It's just to make it accept the syntax like outlined by the, by the standard. And one of these um, syntax ex extensions are the period predicates. I've mentioned them before, like overlap, equals, contains, and all of these, which have equivalents um, in the range types already, I think. OK. Now a few features which I don't explain in so much detail. I think those two features which I've shown you now, the, the um, row pattern recognition and the temporal databases, these are the big features which have huge demand in the scene in the next foreseeable time. These are the features which people ask me about when I present about this. Um, generated columns, you might know them already. Um, this is really an, a really uncommon picture here that, that Postgres falls out of the, of the general market here. Um, what, what other databases use this for is, for example, also function-based indexes. So many databases don't support expression in the index definition. Instead, they put an uh, index on a, a generated column. Um, from standard perspective, it's pretty similar. A computed column, a generated column, can be used almost everywhere where you also can use base columns. That means you can also use them in constraints definition and so on. So these are the use cases from standard perspective. If they are good or not, I don't know. Um, note that the, the generate always as clause is reused between um, identity columns and also the um, system versioning. And here comes one. I would really like the next feature. Who has ever heard of that? Combined data change and retrieval. Ah. OK, is there a reason why it's done differently in Postgres? I don't know that there's a specific reason. OK, I'll show you. It's writable CTs. Who knows writable CTs? Yeah, yeah. OK. So there's a standard way to do that. It looks just a little bit different. So you can have um, delete, update, insert, merge in subqueries in the standard. You just have to prefix it with something old, new, or final, table. And what you're getting then, you can query this data and you can do whatever you like with that. This example um, is valid SQL, and it copies data from some source table to some target table. If you do the same with CTs in, in, in Postgres, it would probably look like that. So you have inside the CT, you have the delete, you're returning everything. And then outside in the main query, you're inserting to that. Um, pardon? I'm just thinking about it in Postgres. There was two rules, very different. <laughs> okay. But I mean, I get your point. It seems like we should be able to support it. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> there are some differences, at least um, some which I have found. Is there are three modes. You have seen old table. For delete, you can, of course, only access old data because there is no new data. 
um, but you can also, uh, um, for update and, and insert, you can also ask for new data. But here comes the, the gotcha. Um, the new data is not actually the final data, and not even the final data is the final data. Um, what it is, is actually there is defined in the sequence of processing, there's one step defined where it takes the data. And this is before, after triggers run, and this is also before some constraint violations run. So the point is, if you ask for new data, you're not necessarily getting the data that is actually written. And then there is the final, which kind of uh, sounds like it would be something different, but final gives you the very same data like new does, but it fails in case there is um, some data change done afterwards. So if you get the result back by final, you will, you will be sure that this is the data that has been written, otherwise it would fail. Um, as opposed to think writable CTEs give you pretty much the data which is stored in the table after, after it was run, which is maybe more useful. So I would probably want another one which does it, like Postgres does it. So yeah. Can you get the old data and the new data? Um, for update? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not at the same time. Not at the same time. Yeah. So you can, you can have it in one. You can have multiple of those in one query, basically. But that would be different statements. Those would be different statements. Yeah, you cannot get both in one step. Yeah, but then you need to update it twice. So you would. It looks like there's no syntax even if you can say that. Yeah. So that's also a question. Why isn't there one for for adding for the I don't know. <laughs> I'm not affiliated with the standard. But the the likely answer, if you look at the support matrix, is because IBM did not have that at that time and they pitched their implementation into the standard. So DB2 can do that, but DB2 has also some limitations, so it doesn't support merge in there. Okay, Postgres doesn't support merge. You can see why, because merge produces old and new, you don't even know which. It depends on which row, right? And you, you kind of want to be able to deal with both in order to be able to support merge. Okay. Yeah. There is definitely some more complexity than in, than in insert update delete, yeah. No question. Um, what f I find interesting, the example which I've shown you, which is valid um, SQL as far as I know, doesn't work in uh, DB2 because in DB2 the main query must always be a select if you have in subqueries some, some data change statements. But you can um, bypass this by chaining uh, with clauses. And at the end you make a dummy, dummy select, select where one equals zero, you know. Okay, um, I'm actually running out of time. I do have some things I will um, click through. Um, partition join um, is filling gaps in time series. As long as you have only one time series, it's easy. Um, if you have multiple groups, um, this is the syntax we have now in the SQL standard. So you can say partition by and then do the gap filling. So it's doing it partition, partition. Only Oracle supports it. List egg, which is very much like string egg. Distinct data types, which is core SQL, but hardly supported. And mentioning the two work in progress things. Um, merge and JSON. I've listed them in separate sections because they are. I, th I think the patches are in such a condition that there is a good chance they are applied at some point in time. So at the moment for JSON everything is red, but once I apply the set of patches, um, pretty much it looks pretty much good at the time. I didn't look into detail. This is re really preliminary results. Uh, I plan to have a closer look and, and uh, report any things I find in there. So this is the overview, and this is the last slide I would like to um, go through in a rush. So whenever a new database release is, is, is coming out, like MariaDB or, the, or Postgres, I aim to publish something about that release within a few weeks on my website. That means at that time, I, I will have this matrix for the new features you're touching. But this is pretty late if you want to have feedback. Um, I usually start to prepare these things and start to test these things when there's a public beta, like now for, for Postgres. Um, but that's also pretty late because it's already committed. The first time I usually notice that there's something new coming to Postgres is when Depes writes about it, waiting for something. This is my trigger, basically. It's also pretty late because it's already committed. So if you want to have my opinion on some of these things, please, just ping me. I don't monitor hackers, but you can reach me. Um, contact is, interestingly, supposed to be shown here, but it's now missing. <laughs> okay. Um, so you can see it actually here uh, or not. So you, you can find me. 
I'm on Twitter, or there's also an email address, but you can find me just on the, uh, over modern SQL. You know, there's also contact and so on. Please ping me. You have to ping me. I, I will try to, to, to help you as good as I can, but you have to ping me because I'm not monitoring the development until it is um, reported by Depeche as waiting for. So sorry for all running five minutes. Um, we have had some questions. If you have more questions, I'll be here till like today. Reach out for me or reach out via Twitter, email, whatever. Thank you.